Um, now, here we get to the first question. We have a cell inside this is the way you define life, the one it evolve. What do you put around it? Membrane. You put a membrane, but I mean so what is it that you it's true, so you know the solution already. Maybe I, I talked too much about the story already. Uh, but essentially the question is what is your demand on what you put around the cell? What, what, can, can you describe what you expect from this membrane or from this thing that should keep malicious things away and let useful things in? Right. It should keep malicious things away and should let beneficial things into the cell. This is one very important reality, yes? It should keep all the things that are important for the functioning of the cell together. So it should keep everything that is supposed to be inside, inside. That's uh, another point, and the, the last point is missing, uh, which is garbage disposal, essentially, right? The cell creates a lot of things that have to be inside, and a lot of things that should get out. So you also need to find a mechanism by which you can secrete, let's call it this way. Um, uh, actually, secrete is, is uh, that, that's sort of misleading. Really. So there's a secretion system. Uh, for most cells, secretion does not mean garbage disposal. For most cells, secretion essentially means that you communicate with the environment. And that's another important function that we haven't discussed about so far. So garbage removal is one that you want to get into the outside world. The other one is communication. Uh, and you want to essentially also possibly attack. Uh, Oops, let me see. This is yeah, okay. But cell membrane controls traffic into and out of the cell, so we have like all the membranes. The cell membrane is in its selective permeability. And it allows some substances to cross it more easily than others. This ability of the cell to discriminate in its chemical exchanges with its environment is fundamental to life, and it is the cell membrane that makes this selectivity possible. In this video, you will learn about the structure of membranes and how the outermost membrane of the eukaryotic cell, the cell membrane or plasma membrane, controls the passage of substances. However, the same general principles of membrane traffic also apply to the many varieties of internal membranes that partition the eukaryotic cell. Membranes are found around the entire cell, the mitochondria, lysosomes, nucleus, and many other organelles. Membranes serve to separate the contents of the cell, or organelle, from its surroundings. Here you can see a lysosome, an enzyme-containing organelle, as it is digesting an old one-hour organelle. The membrane surrounding the digestive enzymes is necessary as a barrier between the digestive enzymes and the rest of the cell. The cell membrane is made up of four main components, carbohydrates, cholesterol, phospholipids, and proteins. So finally you get to, oops. Lipids form a barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. The phospholipids are arranged in a double layer called a lipid bilayer. A pure phospholipid bilayer would allow a very limited number of substances to pass through. Water can diffuse across because it is so small, but this is a slow process. Each phospholipid is made up of a phosphate group and two fatty acid tails. The hydrocarbon tails are nonpolar, unable to bond with water, and are hydrophobic, hydro, water, phobic, fear. The polar phospholipid head has an affinity for water and thus is hydrophilic. When phospholipids are added to water, they form assemblies that shield their hydrophobic portions from the water. See here the formation of a lipid monolayer. Okay, so you have some idea how they look.
there already was an uh, a, a short pointer to the fact that there are more than one membrane. So there, there's an outer membrane, a cell membrane. Prokaryotes essentially have only outer membranes. Some, sometimes they have two. Uh, the flagella here is to, to move or to sense the environment. And all the other processes are sort of within that, distributed in that cell, while eukaryotes, in fact, have a substructure. And the substructure are different compartments inside, and these different compartments are all surrounded by membranes. You can essentially assume or can perceive this as a eukaryotic cell is built up from, from different sort of prokaryotes. And the innermost here is the nucleus, and the nucleus contains all the DNA. And there you already see sort of the, the theme that by having particular compartments, you can dedicate particular tasks to different compartments. Everything that has to do with the DNA is in the nucleus. So there's mitochondria too, that's uh, in blue here. That's a different story. Mitochondria are energy transports and uh, proteins are uh, done in the endoplasmic uh, uh, ribosomes. There's the endoplasmic reticulum, and this, in fact, you begin to see, you get out of the cell by sort of following a, a pathway here. So the specialization to different compartments. Now, the, the way to separate the inside and the outside was already made here in this talk, is the, uh, by this movie, is the lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer is such that inside it's hydrophobic, and that, you may remember, is similar to the way a protein looks. So the core of a protein is also hydrophobic. Outside is hydrophilic because water essentially is surrounding proteins, right? On the surface of a protein, you won't have residues that are friends with water, hence hydrophilic. And inside, you want to have things that are hydrophobic that stick together. Hydrophobic is also something sticky. It's another way of, of sort of imagining it. Uh, and in the membrane, the story turns around, because if you now want to have a protein that goes through the membrane, its environment is no longer water. Its environment essentially is hydrophobic, it's lipid. And that immediately has constraints to what the protein will look like. When you put a protein or any peptide into a lipid, for instance, a membrane helix, that in this shown as the red rod here that goes through the entire membrane, then it is very easy to move this in, the, in, the, in that direction that is indicated by these arrows. It is more complicated to move it in the other direction. So that's sort of in, suggested here by the symbol of the hammer. Uh, to sort of suck, or suck it in or out. That, that is complicated while moving in that direction is very easy. Uh, and here's a story from, and I still don't have the movie, uh, from Marek Basler uh, in the Biocentrum in Basel, that when, when you look at a so-called type 4 secretion system in, in a particular type of bacteria, so what they do is essentially they build up a system shown by, by this black-gray uh, part here to shoot out arrows, and these arrows essentially are targets. So these targets are things with which they attack other bacteria. And this system here, and I, I believe I'm not having quite the right, right story here, um, uh, the, the way this arrow is shot, this system builds up and sometimes spans an entire cell. So this thing is as big as an entire bacterial cell, and it's built up upon flight meaning that is uh, an apparatus that is built up for shooting one arrow, okay? Then it's sort of dismantled and built up again to shoot another arrow. And these arrows are so strong that they, in fact, I showed the hammer that in this direction is very difficult to intrude because you, in fact, the membrane is difficult to, per, per, uh, to intrude from that direction because you want to avoid that people, uh, that other intruders come in, right? But these arrows here easily go through, through two membranes and what they don't know uh, is exactly where, so where in the cell will it be formed. Uh, but say it will be formed here. So that's the, the attacker here. Uh, and then the arrow is shot. And that one here is sensing 
uh, the, the arrow coming in, and you know what it's going to do? This bacterium is going to build up another arrow machinery, shooting back exactly at that point. Now imagine the green one is out of arrows. What do you believe it's going to do? It's going to reuse the one that is shot at them from the red one. This is what bacteria do. Uh, and so th essentially they, they do a lot of this. Uh, so they fire back uh, and the retaliation, they fire back at the same point, but they actually also use the arrow from the, from the other bacterium. Uh, and these, again, just imagine, this is something that is half the size of this bacterium, right? Uh, and has built up in ballpark half an hour. Uh, and it's a constant attack. It's, it's, he has beautiful uh, videos on this. Um, have to find them. Okay, um, another reason why membrane is relevant is because almost all the drug, or a large fraction of the drug targets, in fact, are membrane proteins. Why do you believe this is the case? Because it's easier to get something at the cell rather than in the cell. Exactly. So essentially, when you, this is the first moment of, of a uh, pathogen or anything attacking the cell, right? And if you could interfere with that first attack, that's much simpler than what goes downstream. Meaning, this first attack, once that reagent comes into the cell, all kinds of new processes are triggered. And then, typically, for every next step, two things happen. And so you have to, instead of having one drug, you need two. So this is really at the entry, at the first point of uh, line of entry. So before anything goes into the cell, you want to attack it. This is why so many uh, drugs target this. And typically, the drugs that do not target the membrane, typically don't do it because they failed to target the membrane protein. So they failed to target this anchor or uh, entry point. Uh, and then you had to, re, uh, to, to target something else. Um, but um, now again, proteins that cross the membrane do so with most of those do it with uh, transmembrane helices. Uh, this slide just shows a bunch of these. Uh, and when you see these helices forming here, I mean, here you see all these clouds of helices, and then you on top see a, a sort of mushroom structure or a ball kind of structure, and then something that is sort of condensed. And that always implies that where it's condensed is essentially where the membrane sits. And outside of the membrane, it sort of it, it forms like a ball. It is constrained by the membrane. That's somehow what you see in these images. But you also see that some of them are much larger than others. So in some cases, the part that goes through the membrane is just a few helices, while in others, this is a lot of helices. It's a major structure. Uh, and that ultimately also comes to, to functional reasons. So some of these are channels. Uh, so you want to let things through. Uh, and some of them are simply making connections here uh, that allow some other structure to be on the top. Now, when we ask how much can we do in terms of comparative modeling for membrane proteins, then the blue part is where we can do that. So I said that comparative modeling for normal proteins is about half. Here, the number is much, much less than half. And when we look at how this happens over time, there is no big change. Uh, and the problem here is that although membrane proteins are most important to do structures for because they are relevant for drug uh, targets, they are most difficult to do. And that ultimately comes from the fact that you have, in order to grow a crystal, first of all, you have to get them out of the membrane. And since they need this native environment of the membrane, that's the moment when they fall apart. And that makes it so complicated to get crystal structures for those. Uh, so people are trying all kinds of things, for instance, to sort of grow artificial membrane and have grow a crystal with these artificial membranes. Uh, is one of those things. There are some proteins that are existing in the membrane in high concentration. And those, in fact, were the first structures that were known because they all almost are existing in the same concentration which you need, as, need them as a crystal in the membrane already. Uh, but it continues to be, there are many breakthroughs, but it continues needs to be very difficult. And again, membrane structures, uh, typically, uh, very ma many of these membrane structures were Nobel Prizes because they are so rare and special, uh, in particular for, for drug and understanding health. 
Okay, now there's another aspect of membrane protein. So one is essentially how many helices go through the membrane. Another one is what in this field is called the topology. That means the orientation. So if you begin your, your protein, is the beginning of the protein outside or is it inside? Uh, so there's an out or in. Uh, depending on where the first uh, residue sits. Now, membrane helices are helices. So we could simply apply this method that I showed you before. Uh, it takes a profile and predicts secondary structure in helices, strand and other. What if we did that? And here's an example of a membrane helix. So that's the sequence up here. Observed is a membrane helix and that's what it predicts. So essentially, it's totally wrong. Okay. Now, this is totally wrong because when you look at it, the difference between membrane proteins and non-membrane proteins, uh, and I really have a poor choice of colors. Uh, this I did yesterday night. Uh, on my screen, it looked so different. Stay away from dark colors. So at least you see the, light, uh, the, the, the L here for uh, hydrophilic is what this residue means. So uh, the dark circles where you don't see anything, there's an H written in it, hydrophobic. So in the membrane, you the protein is surrounded by lipid. And on the outside, you have hydrophobic residues. And on the inside, you have hydrophobic residues. While if you're surrounded by water, on the outside of the protein, you have the L residues, the hydrophilic residues. And in the inside, you have the hydrophobic residues, the dark ones where you can't see the H. Uh, and that's a very different environment. So you have a different optimization of in, a, in, a, in a different environment. And that means the sequence looks different. And it means you, you need to do something else. Maybe then, how could you possibly get membrane helices? Well, let's just find out what are hydrophobic residues. Identify hydrophobic residues and see whether there are helices formed or some propensity for helices formed in hydrophobic region. And for that, we can come up with a hydrophobicity scale. One has been proposed by David Eisenberg, uh, one of the first really. So for every single residue, you can measure how much that residue likes to be, likes to be in, in lipid or likes to be away from water. It's hydrophobic and that reflects hydrophobicity. Now, there are different ways in which you can experimentally do that. And I show three different scales here. And uh, now in this scale here, I no longer show the, the probability, but here I show the information content. So different than expected, uh, more than expected, less than expected. Uh, I believe at least that's what I show in the scale here. And so I show this, this, this the Eisenberg scale in green, uh, and two other scales. Um, so these are three different ways of measuring it. The concept of hydrophobicity is totally simple, right? You want to be away from water, okay? You have three different ways of measuring it. You get three different results. Are they different or are they similar? Uh, by the way, I can sort of up the challenge here and show you five scales. Uh, here I don't show information content, I really show a probability for being hydrophobic on a zero to one scale, uh, five different scales, same question. Are they the same? Are they different? Well, they're not the same. That's clear, right? Uh, the next question is, do they still capture the same information? How would you figure it out? Proposal one is you, you sit at it in front of it and stare at it for an hour and then fall asleep and you don't find out. It will not change anything from... I would say the way of measuring methods, right? So maybe they would measure differently so we ah. just cancel it out. Okay. Be careful. So yes, all of these five here, uh, let me not get into what they are, uh, but at least four of these methods are people who measured it explicitly with the idea of capturing membrane helices or trying to figure out what it is that makes a residue want to be in the membrane. Uh, the GES, Eisen, Kite, Doodle and Heine. Uh, they are four scales that essentially are meant to be applied for what I want to apply them for. So somehow they're all optimized to do exactly what we want to do here. Uh, and 
they are not identical, as much as clear. My question to you is, how do you see whether they are correlated? How, how, what would you look at next? Again, you cannot sit in front of this graph a long time and just you have to do something to the data. What could you do? Trying to validate it statistically. I mean, I oh. it to some sequences. And yes, that's a great idea, and we'll get to that in a moment. So the idea here is, okay, I have not said that explicitly, but I've sort of said it implicitly. I want to predict membrane helices. Let's just see how well they do. And that clearly is a sort of, let's call it, hack solution. Uh, I'm not saying anything is wrong with that solution, and we, we are going to get to that in a minute. Uh, this is one, one way of doing it. Yes. What else would you do? You also said the word statistics, but so what would you look at if, if you only had the data? Yeah? Yes, exactly. You would co compute some mutual information, some correlations. You would try to see whether the clusters. Now, this is a graph here on a slightly larger set of 400 indices. Uh, so what in the previous slide was 5, now has grown to 400. And now we actually look at features that are not already meant for membrane. Uh, they're now, they're all sort of supposed to capture something that is related to it but now we and what we do see is that there are some beta propensity alpha propensity biophysical properties composition hydrophobicity and that is in fact the large class of hydrophobicity so about half of them relate to hydrophobicity and they do differ from all the other propensities so that's good news they are more similar to each other anything that calls itself hydrophobicity index is more similar to itself than things that are meant to show that something is a helix or that something is a beta strand. Okay? So there is something coming to them. And that, for me at least, looking at this one here, was not apparent. So this is the kind of thing you only find out when you cluster and possibly cluster different things. And then we get into the next issue, namely the issue of really applying it. How would you apply it? Well, and I'm going to show you on one particular method here that is, uh, has been developed by Gunnar van Heijen. Uh, it's one of the first in the field. Uh, so you have a hydrophobicity scale here, which could be the information content. What runs here is the sequence. Uh, and now essentially what you want to predict is how many transmembrane helices do you have? So again, a transmembrane helix is a helix that is long enough to go through the entire membrane. And long enough means they are sort of typically in the ballpark of 20 residues long. So I told you that regular helices are 10 residues long, so they are twice as long. Yeah. Uh, and one way of doing that is you define a threshold, right? You say whenever my hydrophobicity is a above a certain number, then I call that a membrane helix. What these two numbers here indicate is that he, this method now allows two different thresholds. Uh, so if the higher threshold, the higher threshold is essentially the detection there is a membrane helix here. And if the higher threshold is not long enough, so in this particular case here, this one is long. In this particular case, this is not, maybe not 20 residues long. Then you lower the threshold and see whether at a lower threshold, and there's well, just one second threshold here, that's a lower threshold, and is at that threshold the helix long enough? If at the lower threshold here, we still don't get 20 residues to be hydrophobic, the method says, well, that is not a membrane helix then, okay? And that is a simple way to uh, compute or predict the number of membrane helices here. How could you refine? Is, the idea is clear, right? It's totally trivial. You have one threshold that essentially says that it could be a membrane helix, and then a, lo a slightly lower threshold to say, well, it's not long enough, or is it long enough? You need two thresholds. Essentially, if the signal would be not noisy at all, if there would be a very clear signal, then you would only you would get away with one threshold, but it, as it turns out, there is a lot of noise in between. Noise in between is there are peaks of hydrophobicity, and there could simply be parts of the protein that sit inside, because you have to be hydrophobic inside too, right? Um, 
So there, there's others, when we fold a protein, I already said that a global protein inside is hydrophobic. The membrane protein is hydrophobic outside and inside. So capturing everything here through the hydrophobicity index is a tough thing and as you see from this graph here, uh, it really is not clear where to put it. And the idea of two thresholds makes sense. What else could you do? How would you choose where to put the thresholds? Any idea? Nobody else? Nobody has an idea? How can you... I give you the task, in, uh, if, you, if you had that task in a thesis, how would you do it? Well, you would Google and see whether anybody gives you an answer for that. Uh, but say you base it on your own hydrophobicity index, something that a colleague of yours or somebody you know has measured. And they want to see whether it's better. So this is the question uh, originally with these five scales. Do they correlate? Do they do it the same way? And you already saw they sort of look different. So maybe we need different thresholds for those. So you have to come up with a, an own solution to the problem of where the threshold lies. How would you do that? You've shown that this you know, range of knowns versus unknowns the membrane proteins is not bonded versus zero, right? So there are some membrane proteins that we know. So maybe we'll look at them and define like. So if I gave you a set of 20 membrane proteins, how would you do it? 20 maybe is not statistics. Well, 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 we have, one, we have two numbers, right? So 20 is not enough if we have big machine learning devices with lots of free parameters. But if I have two parameters to choose, well, maybe three, so maybe the type of right of obesity index, uh, and, but then the threshold, but it's not that many, right? So 20, protein, 20 proteins, each protein has a bunch of helices, but maybe enough. So anyway, I gave you 20, what would you do? Anybody? How would you get to the threshold? Any solution? Yeah? Maybe try and error shall take different numbers and look how well it does. Yes. You simply, I don't know, you, you, you die it, you do it on a, uh, on a, ski, on a uh, for a bunch of numbers and step number, you step through and, and it dies of 10 or something like that, right? You, you have a value of from this 0 to 3, you put it into intervals of 0.3 or 0.2 and to try all the numbers and see what it, what it does, right? Uh, and it's brute force relatively easy to do. My next question, however, to you is, what is your criterion for success? Don't tell me that you do the membrane, that you do the prediction right. This is clear. I, I wanted you to tell me how I measure right. What is my criterion for success going to be? Just throwing things at me. In, in this member of that we know, do we know which helices are member helices? Yes. We know. So let me repeat for everybody to hear that. For the membrane proteins for which we know the three dimension structure, we essentially know which membrane heli which helix is a membrane helix. So we know where the membrane regions are. So again, what's your criterion for success? Let's, let's get back uh, to this image that I have here. So we want to know how many membrane helices we have. We want to essentially know where they sit and we want to know how it's oriented. So does that sort of give away what you would measure in order to optimize your parameter for light of obesity? Nobody? Is it too easy? Yeah? Yes, but how? What do we compare? You're totally right. We can compare to what we, what we know, but what exactly do you measure? That's true. I'm not entirely sure that I completely answered. Could you, could you say it a bit louder? 
the whole known number. So essentially, this is, I, I believe that I heard you to say, well, my choice of score implies that I give a certain number of helices, and the number can be right or wrong. That is one answer, right? Uh, we, in effect, this is, is a very simple, very clear answer. And now you can say yes or no, so you can say, uh, you can do that in a binary way, or you can look at the difference. Uh, in the number, so the difference between the number observed and, and predicted, or some some ratio of the two, the fraction of the number uh, that you got. So there's, there's unfortunately the simple idea has a few different solutions. But there's another issue here with the number alone. We also, of course, if we had the prediction, I'm going to show you an image later. Uh, we also somehow want to know where the mem membrane here exists. So if somebody says, okay, this protein here has one membrane helix, but if it says that the membrane helix is somewhere here, then yes, the number would be right, but the prediction would still be relatively wrong. So we ha somehow also want the, the, the helix to be placed roughly in the, same, uh, in the same region. And let's talk about that in a minute. But the number is the simplest way of looking at it. In fact, this is very different from what we looked at so far for secondary structure prediction. So far, we really asked how many residues are correctly predicted in the helix. For the membrane helix, this may not be the most important thing. What really may be important, most important is how many membrane helices are there and do I roughly get them. Here's another story uh, about the orientation. So how can I get the finger on the orientation? And the answer to that again came from Gunnar van Heine and he simply, what he did, is he looked at all these regions that connect the membrane helices and looked at the differences in their sort of biophysical features. Uh, so that's the outside space here in blue and the inside loops here in red. Uh, that's the number of positive residues and you immediately see what he coined the positive inside rule. So there is an excess of positive charges at the inside. Okay, so you have more positive charges here than here. So how can you use that to predict the orientation? Yes? How about the helices charge? Are they charged? No. So that is the, the charge comes essentially, what you count here is the connect, connection points outside the helices. Well, if you know pluses and minuses, just take the spaces between them and you know where it starts. So you can track it. Yes, so essentially what you do is you have a prediction of a helix here, you cut out the, the things in between, you simply count the positive charges in the things in between on the even here, uh, on the odd and the even side, and then you do even minus odd, and then you see which one is in and which one is out. Uh, and that is essentially what this method does. In fact, uh, his method went one further by saying, well, I'm going to optimize the threshold. I'm going to have a dynamic threshold and I'm going to optimize it such that this positive inside rule gives the strongest signal. So you can essentially get away here without defining a threshold once and for all for all proteins and you simply say for that particular protein I choose whatever threshold gives me the highest distinction between the uh, even and odd numbered loops in terms of the positive charges. Okay, Very easy. Uh, so you essentially do an optimization for every single protein but you do that without knowing what its structure is so you do an optimization of something that is not really a free parameter uh, in that sense. And that method for the time worked actually surprisingly well. Another way, and it already somehow uh, came forward in a suggestion here uh, from you, another way could be that you define a hydrophobicity index such that you can optimally predict membrane helices. So rather than just choosing the known structures to predict the threshold for hydrophobicity, you choose the entire hydrophobicity index, and that is almost like a propensity, right? You take the data and you, you define a propensity. Now, when you essentially do that in a machine learning device, you turn what initially went totally wrong by simply doing whatever we did before, but now instead of having HEL as output, you train this only on membrane helices or proteins with membrane helices and not membrane helices and you essentially have two output units, membrane, not membrane, uh, and you get these uh, predictions. Now, it turns out that I said 
the first level here for secondary structure prediction had two short segments and that we needed the second level to in fact see a correlation between adjacent residues and predict helices so to see that helices have to have a minimal length so the second level network here made the segments longer right you remember remember that um, in this particular case the second level works too well the definition of works too well is now the helices instead of being average length of observed they're twice as long or many of them are very very long so what, what can you do and thank you that reminds me that i have to switch my thing off so the hack solution here is well you know it's an average 20 if this thing predicts something that is 40 you cut it and that's the dumbest solution and because I, 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 I had, I, so I wanted to, to, to submit that tomorrow morning and I wanted to leave uh, for some trip tomorrow morning so I had to find a solution overnight. Essentially that was the cut algorithm uh, and it sort of worked. But a refined version is essentially this idea here. Now this is the unit of non-transmembrane and here's the residue number, meaning the first residue of protein and build it up. So what you see here, high propensity for not membrane, low propensity not membrane, high propensity not membrane, and this is one minus that, that's the transmembrane helix. Uh, so just looking at it, somewhere here is a membrane and somewhere here is several membrane helices. So now the idea is we can find a sort of dynamic solution, dynamic programming kind of solution. And this goes the following way. So first of all, I know that membrane helices have between 15 and 25 or 27 residues. Now I knew at the time. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just create a pool of all the segments between 15 and 25 that are compatible with the membrane potential. So that look like transmembrane, right? And for each of these, I will have an average, if that is a transmembrane helix, here I sum over that length and I, I get an average, right? Uh, if the membrane helix is longer, I get a slightly lower average because the longer one has a lower value, right? The higher ones have a higher value simply because of the peak here. That's clear, right? So I will have this pool of segments and each segment has a, a probability or a strength according to the prediction. Now if my protein had one transmembrane helix, which one would you take from this pool? Totally trivial. Yeah? Sure. I mean, this, this, it may not always be the best solution, but what else would you do? You're certainly not going to pick the one with the lowest, right? Uh, and you're certainly not going to go for something that is average. No, you're going to, if, if you believe this is one, you pick the, the, the strongest. Okay, so this is the model here. If it has one transmembrane helix, then it's this one. Now, if it has two, we pick the second highest one, right? The second highest one would be this one. This is not possible because that's already, the model is already here's a membrane helix. So this, we have to find the second highest that is not conflicting with this one, which happens to be this one here. Okay? And then if it has three and so forth and so on, right? It's a very simple algorithm and you can guarantee that at every single step here, if it has one, you find the best model for one. If it has two, you find the best model for two. Okay? And it's very, very easy to do. Very simple uh, dynamic programming like algorithm. Uh, and then you need to define uh, a resolution. When is it that you add another membrane helix and you actually decrease the overall signal? Well, one way of doing that is by if you add something that is smaller than 0.5. That's a trivial way. So if there's nothing left that looks like a membrane helix, you have to stop. But you may define a different stop criterion for the algorithm. And then again, you compile the difference in the loop and you div uh, give, that gives you an orientation. When you do all of that, then this is what you get. Uh, so this thing that was previously predicted to be largely wrong now is impressively right. Yes? Do we know in advance how many helices are 
No. So we do, and again, so the number of helices is the task. It's not known. For a particular protein, I do not know whether it's in a membrane at all. For, uh, I have some idea which of the 20,000 human proteins are in the membrane, but experimental evidence I have for very few of those. So we believe at this point, I may get back to that, uh, we believe that about 20 to 25 percent of all the human proteins are in the membrane. So that means 20,000, we have 5,000, and for, the, for not even 1,000, I really have experimental evidence that they are. Yes? Can so maybe ask a question? Do we know how, how many membrane helices are within the protein? Because from what no, no, again, so I do not know, so again, for uh, most human membrane proteins, I do not know that they are membrane proteins, I can only predict it. And for many of the ones for which I know, so for those, I also don't know the number of helices. For them, I don't even know that they are membrane uh, associated, so I certainly don't know the number of helices. And for many of the ones for which I know that they are in the membrane, I'm not sure about the number of membrane helices. Okay? And that's exactly what we're trying to predict. Now, this is one way of doing it. Uh, can you think about another way of, of predicting membrane helices? With, with some other machine learning devices, uh, have I presented machine learning devices to you that would sort of fit to this issue? Yes, everybody these days is saying deep learning, but that's not what I'm fishing for. Yeah? Maybe if you want to separate these, um, the, the, the loops from inside the cell and outside the cell as much as possible to support that. Ah. Yeah, so support vector machine, uh, I'm biased, so some of for me support vector machines and neural networks uh, have a high similarity in the way they do the math. So for me, they are sort of the similar devices. Yes, support vector machine may do it. And in fact, uh, uh, one of the best methods out there is a support vector machine. On next Tuesday, Michael Bernhofer is going to give you another solution to the issue that in fact combines four different types of machine learning devices for four different aspects of the same task here. And you uh, had a very interesting rationale saying for, in, in fact, distinguishing between the loops that are making the positive inside rule, we need something else. And SVM is in fact exactly a solution for that. Yes, that, that is one, one, one thing. Something else. So what I meant was the hidden Markov model. Uh, the hidden Markov model, again, the beauty of the hidden Markov model is you can, if you have any problem that has a grammar, that has, you have some understanding, you have some a priori knowledge about there's a st structure to the problem. The structure here is the following. You, in fact, have uh, a globular region, so a part that is not in the membrane. Then you have on the side of the inside of the membrane, you, you have some loop. And then you get a sort of a capping region, so the end of a helix. You get into the helix, you get in the capping region on the outside, uh, you have a short loop, uh, or go into a globular region, you have a long loop, you go into a globular region, uh, you have a capping signal on the outside to get back into it. So all of these have different biophysical realities. So the capping region is just the thing at the interface between a lipid bound and water bound, right? So these caps here, they may just slightly see different uh, biophysical environments simply because they are at an interface of two different realities. Outside is water, inside is lipid. Uh, and this is true on both ends of it. So all of this is a, is a structure, is a, is a grammar, is something that you can put into your model. And each part here, you can model by different probability system, right? And by different features. So you could essentially describe these here as machine learning devices that you, that you combine uh, through a probabilistic model. And the simplest way of doing that is really the, the HMM, where each of these is modeled by a set of probabilities, transition probabilities, for going into that state or remaining in that state. Okay? Uh, and this is one solution here uh, that came from Anna Schoch, who in fact uh, got hidden Markov models into alignment methods, got them into the field of computational biology uh, and Eric Sonheimer's group. The method is called TMHMM. Uh, TM transmembrane hidden Markov model. 
Uh, here's another one, HMM top, that also uh, predicts the orientation of a protein at the same time. That comes from a Hungarian group, from Istvan Simon, uh, Gabor Tushnadi. Um, essentially the same idea, the details are very different, uh, and HMM top team HMM, they, they are competitors, they, they both sort of have different strengths. Now, we talked about when, we, I asked the question, when do membrane predictions, when are they right? When I simply get the number of helices right was one answer. Uh, let's get into a little bit more detail here. Say in the green what I show you is three observed membrane helices, or one or two or three. And in orange, I show you something that is a predicted helix. And in this particular case, we have a case where I'd argue we have the same number in principle. So the prediction is three and the observation is three. So by the criterion that we discussed so far, this would be a correct prediction. But now I'm actually sort of upping the, the challenge. And I'm saying, well, you could argue that this predicted helix here, so we have two observed helices, and the predicted helix somehow spans them both. It somehow finds the signal. But actually, it's one. The prediction is one, the observation is two, R2. So that already is wrong, right? Um, here, the story is slightly the other way around. I do see the region, but I split it apart. I believe there are two transmembrane helices in my prediction, where in reality there's only one. So how could I somehow, what is your intuition for what is right here? Does, do you guys have an intuition here? Yeah. I think you should switch the signs every time when you go to another helix. So if this, mentally, if the sign of your prediction and reality is different, you should count this the right thing. Because for me, if you take into account not only the like, overlap of ages and ages in predictions, but also ins and outs, here, ins and outs are completely different, right? You go in once and out when the observed one does it twice already. So maybe you take into account not only the overlap of illnesses, but also the direction you're moving in cell or out. Ah, the, the topology. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, the, well, I'm, the solution that I'm, that I'm fishing for now is, in fact, you're, so he says, uh, what I'm ignoring here is the orientation in terms of the cell. I'm not ignoring whether I'm going outside the cell or inside the cell. I'm completely ignoring that reality because what I show is a membrane helix or not membrane helix. I'm not labeling the loops in between. Some of them are inside, outside. I leave that label out here, and I should put that back in. That's a, that's a very good point. Actually, nobody really has, has done that in a rigorous way. Uh, not because it's not a good point. Um, because we, I believe, ultimately, we try to solve this one first. And this is what I direct you in this, in this lecture, too, simply because I have this slide. Uh, so the question is, what is your intuition? Is this an entirely correct prediction? Again, if we count it like secondary structure prediction, we count the number of residues correctly predicted, this is almost entirely correct. You make tiny mistakes here. In terms of counting per residue, this is a small, these, these things here are small mistakes. Uh, if I now want to predict the segments, am I right or am I not right? Clearly, number three is not enough, yes? Ah, that's now you impose a numbering, right? Yes. And this numbering only makes sense if you really, well, again. So, um, so you, you okay? Let's let's just look at these two. Uh, so I ignore everything else. Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what he meant. Okay, let's begin with the first helix. So that's what he clearly said. Uh, so we should compare only the O1 to the P1. Yes. And that, I believe, is exactly right. Uh, so now we can ask, what kind of criterion could we could you think about to, to say whether O1 and P1 fit? What could you look at? Yeah? The position start. 
Yes, so we could ask simply the overlap. And we could argue, is, the overla is there a minimal overlap? Right? This is the simplest one that we could argue. We know transmembrane helices are 20 residues long. Well, we say if they overlap at least 10, uh, or whatever the number is, or 12, 8, or some, some number, then I'm content, I'm call, call that right. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is I could say, well, the ends here can be off by maximally a certain number. This is in fact what we do now. We now say that if this is more than 5 off the difference here, then it's not correctly predicted. In this particular case here, that would lead to calling P, P1 a wrong prediction, because this end is more than five residues off. Uh, maybe this still is, is, is okay, but today we would no longer consider that right. In the past, so when this paper was done here, pe most people said if there's any overlap, then essentially it was correctly predicted. Now, when there's any overlap in the past, many people counted, okay, there's some overlap here, so that is right. And then there's some overlap here, so that one is right too. So, uh, and I believe this is exactly what you said, we should introduce a number in here, we should distinguish, but in, which implies for the logic here, we don't double count. Uh, so if we consider that right, then we can no longer consider that right as well. So we can e count each one only once. Uh, once. Um, so today we would essentially say this is incorrectly predicted as a prediction for that and incorrectly predicted as a prediction for that, so it's wrong. Uh, and the same is true for the other two. So essentially today we would call this an entirely incorrect prediction. So the number is right, uh, but ultimately the, the, the overlap given plus minus five in the, in the, in the end position is, is just zero, yeah? So in this particular case, typically, so for membrane proteins, the question is, are these the same, in the same domain? Uh, typically, membrane regions constitute one domain, but this is very, um, in some sense, so domains are formed as gl uh, things that form a globalist unit and fall on their own. And we assume that this is the case for the entire membrane region, although we know that in some cases proteins come together uh, and form membrane helices. So there are examples where essentially you have three membrane helices coming together from three different proteins or from three different regions in a protein. So in that particular case, those three would not be in the same domain because they are from three different proteins. But looking at it, if I cut this out on a screen, they look like a domain because they form a globular substructure. They form, I cannot classify them as a domain because I know they come from different proteins, but this is the kind of thing that I typically would call a domain. Okay? So in the field of membrane uh, regions, things are a little bit different, but for most of them, and I'm afraid that I may have to jump a few slides back in order to make that point. Um, just bear with me. Yeah, there we are. So, for some of those here, you see, so they form, uh, for many of those, you will immediately see, they form something that looks like a compact unit. So, they, they form a domain. Okay? And then there is, in many of these cases here in white, uh, there is something on the outside that forms its own domain. Now, here it already gives away the blue and the orange here. Those are, in fact, the blue and, and uh, orange are uh, intertwined, like, like these two fingers here. And in that sense, they form a domain, but blue and orange on that leftmost one here, they, in fact, are different parts, uh, different proteins. So that's an example where the domain comes together. But if you cut this out and remove the color, this looks like a regular domain. Okay? But you still see that even in this case, there is an immediate visual difference between this sort of compact part and this part up here. So, in the, sorry for that. Um, Okay, so in this particular case I said the 
prediction would be 0% accurate. Now, we have a bunch, since memory prediction is so important, we have a bunch of prediction methods. Uh, and we're going to show here this one answer. So I can essentially now take this and say some predictions are right for helices, and I can say there are proteins for which I get all helices right. So if the, the maximal deviation on the ends, the number is right of memory and helices, the maximal deviation is less than five on either side, then for every helix in the protein, I call it right. And on the next slide, I'm going to ask for how many proteins in the database, for, for what fraction in the database, do I essentially get all the memory and helices right? For a bunch of different methods. Uh, and you see that somehow the average for this particular data set here appears to be 80%. I say appears to be because now the problem comes since we have so few and we literally don't have a hundred proteins or maximally sort of in the ballpark of a hundred uh, and these methods all completely over optimize whatever they do on these few proteins for which we know and it's very very difficult to get to new structures they come at a very low rate so for new structures these numbers always drop and then somebody really changes their method immediately and the new structure also works so it's very difficult to estimate uh, but what you do see so there are two methods out here uh, that are older and they perform so there are methods that are better newer methods that are better here the blue one that is the SVM I guess no it's Polyphobius uh, What's the SVM? Uh, oh, it's this one. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's one of the highest ones. Uh, again, there are different ways of, of plotting the number, and Michael may, may be giving you some. Uh, but it's a very contested field, and the error bars, you see that according to the structures we have, they, they are relatively similar. Uh, there are, however, some issues with these methods. Uh, and these issues ultimately relate to the fact that the more we advance in terms of experimentally doing membrane proteins, the more we have, we see that this idea that the helix is orthogonal to the lipid, is about 20 residues long, is actually not right. There are many exceptions to this. Um, and I'm going to, sh going to show you a few of these uh, samples and I'm at the same time going to show you a few, a few slides that illustrate how many membrane proteins do we have in an organism. Let's begin with a, with a different slide. The different slide is plotting the length of proteins in, two, in three different kingdoms. Uh, archaea in red, bacteria in green, and blue is eukaryotes. Number of residues in the protein, percentage of proteins. And essentially you see that these three distributions are very similar. So proteins, whether they are from bacteria or eukaryotes, essentially look similar in terms of their length. There's a huge distribution for all of them, so on distributions like this, the mean really doesn't make sense, even the median doesn't make sense. Uh, to say that an average protein here for the green one is 100 or it's almost 200 residues is nonsense because it is much more reasonable to say proteins span from 50 to 400 in the screen. Uh, and essentially that's a, the entire population is, is widely spread but then there's a lot of the population here. The only thing where these three really differ is for very long proteins and number of proteins here that is longer than a thousand residues you see archaea and, uh, so, and bacteria green and red both are in the ballpark of one percent cumulative so le fewer than one percent of all the proteins in an organism are longer than a thousand while in eukaryote that is seven percent so that's a big difference but overall the number here the tail is different but overall the number is not the length is not very different when i look at what amino acid is used again now i take a bacterium has three thousand or, or two thousand to five thousand uh, proteins and that is essentially uh, compiled for all these five thousand three thousand proteins what how many alanines is, are used and compile that over all archaea bacteria and eukaryotes and the height of the letter is proportional to the usage of that letter in that kingdom and essentially again it's ultimately the same right um, now when we ask how many membrane proteins are there? People assumed 
that the number would be very different between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And the argument was simply membrane proteins are relevant for communication and eukaryotes are more complex. There's a lot of lot cell-to-cell -cell communication going on in the body. If you have a multicellular organism, you need more cell-to-cell -cell communication, was the assumption, than in a bacterium. Here, what we see is eukaryotes, and this is an old slide, but essentially it's still true, bacteria and archaea, essentially the same thing uh, for membrane proteins. For coiled coil proteins, so these are long helices, uh, there is a, a difference, uh, but okay, the membrane protein essentially is similar. Statistics, uh, again, we have about a thousand structures at this time. To, today we, we have more, we maybe we have 2,000, I don't know what the number is today. Uh, but less than 2% of the structures clearly are membrane proteins, and 20% of all the proteins are membrane proteins, and 50% of the drug targets are membrane proteins. So there you somehow see that what we have, well, the, the need to get structure for membrane proteins is much higher than what we have. Um, now, I believe I'm going to go through these slides, uh, zip forward through these slides. No, I'm not even going to zip through these slides. Uh, thanks to Arne anyway, but I'm not going to use the slides. Uh, just the next one because it, it looks nice. So what we see now is that the, mem the idea that I said that already, the helices transpass this membrane in a very orthogonal way and helices are 20 residues long is true for many proteins, but in many other proteins, however, you see that here, you see that there are, the membrane heats are at angles, and you immediately see that if you want to put the membranes have the same width. Now, I said if it's orthogonal, you need sort of 20 to 25 residues, and if it's at an angle, you immediately see that you need more residues, right? So this is the first problem. The next problem is that we have seen many where sort of half of the helix goes here, half of the helix goes here. Uh, so the, the helix doesn't go quite through and they're not even touching. Uh, then we have seen a lot of helices that just go in a little bit and come out again. There's an example of oops, there's an example of a helix, this thing I try to show here is in the blue. Um, so re-entry helices, re-entry regions that go in and out. Uh, and all of these you need different prediction methods for. Uh, ultimately, however, this is one of those stories where we still work on methods, and Michael will present one to you, but we still work on methods that we have worked on 20 years ago and we try to refine because there is such a high necessity to predict such a simple feature. And with this, I'm going to close for today.